<laughs> All right. Well, oh, so it's live again. We're live. So pick up where you left off. Pick up? All right. Welcome back. Thank you for bearing with us through the uh, technical challenges. This is part of the new world we're living in. As we are all relating uh, virtually and having to connect, uh, we run into these things. So th thank you for bearing with us. Hang in there because you are in for a treat this evening. Um, our format is consistent, whether we are in person at CONCAT or uh, virtual through our, our YouTube uh, live channel. That is, we invite uh, two tellers to join us. And um, these uh, tellers might be people that we have reached out to, or they may be people that reach out to us. We are open to either. And you can let us know if you think you might like to tell at some point. Um, and so we have two tellers, um, each who will share a story with you that is uh, about roughly 15 or 20 minutes. At the end of the telling, I'll check in with the teller and see um, if there's some questions that they might be open to uh, responding to. So you have an opportunity to participate by entering questions uh, into our chat box on the YouTube channel. And we will be checking that and uh, posing those to our storyteller. So after the completion of each story, there'll be a little Q&A uh, and then we'll shift to our, our second teller for the evening. Again, another 15 or 20 minute story followed by an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so without any further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our first teller for the evening. Uh, our first teller is Amy Jo Myers. And Amy is a participant who's come to our Storytellers New Haven in the past and uh, reached out and indicated that she would be interested in taking a turn in the teller's seat. So we are excited to have her. She is a uh, New Havener for the past 25 years, having come here uh, after attending college. She is a social worker, um, lives here with her wife, Janice, and their dog. So we are excited to hear from Amy. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Right, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Okay, Prepare great. Prepare to listen to Amy. Have you ever Googled yourself? I have, and nothing much comes up. I had a private therapy practice for a short time a few years ago, and for some reason that phone number and address still pops up. And my job as a clinical social worker at the Yale Child Study Center also comes up, but nothing terribly exciting, also nothing embarrassing. So my online footprint is rather dull, which I must admit I'm pretty glad for. Have you ever Googled a friend or a relative, maybe a parent? A few months ago, I did that too. I was driving around on a Saturday afternoon running errands. I returned my library book, went to the grocery store, gassed up my car. And while I did all of that, I was listening to a public radio show called This American Life. Perhaps you're familiar with it. As I often am with these podcasts, I was brought to tears while listening to the story. The narrator recounted a time when he attended his friend's funeral and saw the deceased man's young daughter run out of the church wailing uncontrollably. The narrator thought she was running away because she was overcome with grief, but it turned out that she was overcome with shame. She was ashamed of the way her father died. He had been a Marine and did not die by what she thought and what she thought others would think was an honorable Marine death. He died by suicide. And so this little girl ran from her father's funeral to get away from all of the people that she thought would hate her and that she thought were judging her because of the way her father died. As it turned out in that moment, the intensity of her shame was way more powerful than her grief and loss. And I sat in my car that Saturday afternoon, listening to the radio in the Fairhaven library parking lot, tearing up and relating to her and feeling her shame. 
my father did not die by suicide. My father was not in the military. My dad grew up poor on a sharecropper's farm in South Carolina in the 1940s. And when I was a kid, he often recounted stories about the terrible irony of always being hungry, yet being surrounded by so much food on a farm. He ended up in Connecticut, first by way of New York City with a wife and three kids. My dad was wicked smart, but not educated. He was really sensitive, but also tall and dark skinned both vulner vulnerabilities for him in our rural small town in the Northwest Hills of Connecticut, where he lived with me, my mom, and my two older siblings. So many of my dad's traits and experiences boiled together into a brew that made him into a man with a drinking problem. And so many of my childhood memories are punctuated by his intoxication. He was never mean, never violent. More so, he was quite affectionate. He was pensive and a little sad even when he was drinking. He was clumsy and forgetful. And so he would do things like listen to the same John Coltrane album, the same side of the album, with the needle going to the end and going back to the beginning of the record and to the end and to the back of the beginning of the record for hours, torturing my entire family and leaving me with saxophone melodies that forever haunt my memories. He would forget that he was cooking something and start a small kitchen fire. Or he'd go for long drives on windy roads in the Litchfield Hills usually driving to see a girlfriend. And so yes, he also cheated on my mom. So the memories in between his drinking were also memories of my parents fighting over his drinking or over a girlfriend. But despite my father's very obvious flaws, I really loved him. I loved his patient way of explaining things to me with kindness so that I would under understand. I love that he took interest in the books that I like to read and would sit and listen to me read aloud from, for him for hours as I held books from the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House series. This made me feel so important because my dad himself was an avid reader. He had stacks and shelves of books and when he was home, he was often seen reading and puffing on his pipe, smoke curling up. He taught me how to ride a bike. He took me to pick out my first pair of glasses. He taught me how to drive a manual shift car. It's a confusing thing as a kid when your parent is really kind and patient and smart and also often too drunk to pick you up at your friend's house or to sign his name on a permission slip for school. But that was my dad. When I was a kid, I was sure that my dad would die before my 10th birthday. One of the things that gave, gave me a pretty good dose of childhood insomnia, especially on the nights when he wasn't home before I went to bed. I would lay awake envisioning his car skidding off the highway into a ditch or smashing into a utility bowl, pole on one of the dark country roads that twisted through our town. He was a drinker and driver. And by the time I was a teenager, I was especially worried about this because when I was in high school, he was arrested twice, then a third time for driving under the influence. He lost his driver's license for an entire year and was mandated to go to AA. His name was in the newspaper, our small town newspaper police blotter, and I was mortified. By the time I was in high school, I was incredibly skilled at blending into an environment where everything about me stuck out. Blending in took a lot of effort in my upper middle-class town where 97% of the population was white where I didn't have any black friends until I made one when I was 16. 
where my white classmates wore Benetton and polo to school and took ski trips with their families, while my black family teetered on the lowest end of the middle class and rarely went on vacation anywhere. So blending in required a lot of energy and effort, but I had plenty of anxiety to invest to this goal and I was an overachiever. I became an amazing code switcher before I even knew there was an actual term, code switching. Telling my friends we'd had roast beef and carrots for dinner on Sunday when we'd really had fried chicken and collard greens. We never eat roast beef. I learned not to talk about cornbread after a friend asked me to taste the piece I had in my lunchbox. She practically spit it out because when she had seen it, she thought and was expecting it to be a square of yellow cake. In elementary school, I told my friends I went to my grandma's house in the summer and described times sitting on a rocking chair in her front porch when I'd really gone to my Nana's house or my Mamie's house and spent the days sitting on her front stoop in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, New York. I had no easy answers from my classmates when kids asked me why I wore my hair in braids all of the time or what country my grandparents were from. I didn't know how to handle being other and my father's drinking was just another thing I knew the kids at school would never understand. And so when, I, when my dad was arrested and his name was in the newspaper, there was no code I could switch. There was no amount of blending in I could do to hide my shame and embarrassment. Any fleeting fantasy of hiding was crushed the day I arrived to my geometry class in 10th grade and someone had cut the police blotter from the newspaper and taped it to my desk. My shame was unbearable and I was so angry at my dad. So angry at him for blowing my cover and for leaving me no place to hide no possible way to blend in. So angry at him for reminding my classmates that I was not like them and never could be. I was not skinny or blonde or rich with a father who worked in an office building or who golfed or who could drink just one drink. I was so angry and so ashamed that he had exposed the facade and fortress I had painstakingly built and protect, protected for so many years. But like most people do, I survived high school, but I did not stop worrying about my dad or worrying about his untimely and possibly gruesome death. I did not forgive him easily, but harbored so much resentment and, and anger toward him. And as the years passed, I wondered if my father would live to see me fall in love one day. I wondered if he would be there if I ever got married. And amazingly, he did live that long and he was there and he blessed my marriage to my childhood friend. He was there and visited the home that we bought shortly after our wedding. My fears proved to be unfounded. He never wrapped his car around a telephone pole. He never fell to a sudden tragic ending while in some intoxicated state. And as an adult, I found courage and language to talk to him about the many years of worrying for him, about my anger, about his actions and his behavior. And he listened and he heard me. And so there was some relief. But regardless of all of my years of anticipated worry and grief, I could never be prepared for his actual death. That came when I was 40 and he was 70. He died in a hospital bed in the same hospital where I was born in that small town in Northwest Connecticut where my mother still lives. I was there with him as was my entire family. And almost nine years later, I sit in my car on a Saturday afternoon listening to This American Life on the radio and my heart pains for this 10 year old girl running from her father's funeral trying to run away from shame. I am brought back to being 10 and to my own, my own shame. And I'm sorry for this little girl that her father died when she was so young. 
I'm so relieved that my father didn't when I was so young. I'm so sorry that she's at an age when she can't possibly separate herself or her own worth from her father's or separate her hurt and pain from his. I'm sad about the years that she might define her father by his worst actions and mistakes as I remember it was so hard for me not to do. I wanna hold out hope that as she lives her life and as she matures and reflects, the shame for her father can be replaced by compassion for him. But I don't know this girl. I don't know her father. I don't know what will happen to her or what she'll do. But I do know that with that young girl's story lingering in my mind all day that Saturday this past February, what I did, I turned on my laptop and was seeking uh, the Google for some answers. Feeling a little like a glutton for gloom and punishment, I, I wondered, is my childhood shame still living dormant somewhere inside of me? Would I run away with that lump in my throat if I were to happen to see my father's arrest records online? Knowing it's quite a long shot because he was arrested in the mid 1980s, which was way before the World Wide Web. I don't know what I thought I would find, but I typed in my father's name and address into the search bar on Google, Jean Henry Myers, New Milford, Connecticut. And this is what I saw. To the Myers family, my condolences go to you, to Jean. He was always a joy. I first met Jean when I started working at Benris Watch Company. Then many years later, I met him while he was working at Stop and Shop. I also had the joy of taking care of him several times at New Milford Hospital. Jean always had a smile and would never hurt anyone. May Jean always be with you. Here's to you, Jean, till we meet again. I blinked and read it again and realized that this message was from my dad's legacy page on the site legacy.com. I'm sure the man at the funeral home said something to us about how they would post my dad's obituary on that site in addition to the local newspaper. But who remembers what the man at the funeral home says when you're making arrangements for your father's funeral? I sure didn't remember. And I've never read anyone's legacy page. I never really thought about them, but was beyond surprised to have stumbled upon my father's. I clicked it and read all of the messages. To the entire Myers family, I'm so sorry for your loss. Mr. Myers always had a smile for everyone and a friendly hello. He will be missed. God bless this wonderful man who made my daughter's many hours at Stop and Shop a real pleasure. His sense of humor and great wisdom will be sadly missed by my daughter and by all of us who had the pleasure of crossing his path. My husband enjoyed playing chess with Jean. I will always remember his kindness to my mother when she fell on ice and broke her leg and foot badly. Jean took off his leather coat, put it on my mom as she lay on the ice waiting for an ambulance. I didn't know Jean, but we shared the same last name. And at one time about 10 years ago, he received my mail and we joked about it. What a nice man he was. I remember Mr. Myers fondly. He was a true gentleman who provided excellent customer service with great kindness. I've known Jean for well over 40 years when he and my dad became fast friends. I'll never forget the sight of Jean at my kitchen table last year, sharing his kindness and memories when my father passed while wolfing down my dad's favorite cherry pie. To the Myers family, Jean was a great childhood friend from South Carolina who will be sorely missed. I have fond memories of Jean from the years we lived in New Milford. His daughter and our daughter were best friends during their school year. He always treated our daughter like family. Where do I begin? My heart aches for his friends and family. I have nothing but fond memories of Jean and on and on. And on went the memories that I read on legacy.com. So thankfully, when I Googled my dad, I did not find 
the remnants of shame that I thought that I might find. Googling my father turned out to be way more satisfying than Googling myself. Um, and instead of my childhood shame being restored, I found proof that my father was a multidimensional person, so much more than a man who struggled with alcoholism and other injuries. I found people who knew him and recognized him and the reasons that I had loved him too. And reading these messages also shed the reminder that I am much more than a child of an alcoholic. Shame had never aided me in my childhood process and likewise, it would not aid me in my grief or healing. It turns out that my feelings for my dad are, are rich and pretty complex, and that people have many more dimensions than those that can be defined or confined by shame, but they may take many years in their discovery. Thank you. Amy, thank you so much for sharing your story. <clears throat> that was so beautiful. And the way that you brought uh, your father's uh, memory alive for us was really beautifully, beautifully told. I'm reminded of the, um, and it, as I pose my first question, let me also say to our YouTube audience that if you have a question uh, for, for Amy, please feel free to post it in our, in our YouTube chat page. Um, you're getting a comment already that said just outstanding, outstanding story. Um, but I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the expression that um, we often hear about how important it is to give people their flowers while they can, while they can smell them. And I was thinking of that as you were reading the messages on the legacy.com page. And just wondering, do you, do you think your dad had any, any sense of how he was thought of or, or the, 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 love and expression that people made to him on the on the legacy? Do you think he, he recognized that in his living? I don't think so. Um, I think that, you know, I'm not sure I would have thought about it at the time, but I think my dad also maybe had, was living with lots of shame of his own. And so I'm not sure that he would have guessed that those are the messages that people would have left for him. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Which is too bad, right? <laughs> Can you, do you listen to Coltrane now? And, I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I never would. What does it bring up for you now? Well, I, I think one of the things about my dad is he had a great sense of, of music and culture and reading. And so I really appreciate how much he influenced me in that way. And so I, I really love a lot of the music that when I was a kid, I thought was like really crazy noise and like crazy. He had a pretty wide range of musical tastes and some of it I liked when I was a kid, but a lot of it, I just thought he played way too loud and um, <laughs> too repetitiously and had no appreciation of it, but I really do love it now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I have to say, I, um, I very much connected with, uh, your uh, little house on the prairie uh, <laughs> references. All right, let's see, what do we have coming up? Um, so there's a question actually from one of last month's um, tellers. Uh, Roxana has posted a question here. Uh, first, she's thanking you for sharing. Um, and she's also asking, how do you think uh, your dad felt about your experience with race as a child? Mm. <laughs> Um, wow, that's really complicated. I think, um, I think that my parents moved to this little town in, in Connecticut um, with the idea that moving out of New York City was going to give me a better life, quote unquote, than they had had. And, you know, I'm not really sure that they were equipped to either to um, with what was facing them and being the only black family for miles. Mm -hmm. um, and raising three black daughters in a, in a really very white town. And so I think that, you know, for a long time, I really, 
um, wasn't sure, you know, why. I, I think I was really encouraged to try to blend in and not to make waves um, or to be too outspoken or too loud. And I think, you know, as a teenager and a young adult, it was very, that was confusing to me because I always thought, you know, why didn't my parents maybe encourage me to stand out a little more or to kind of embrace things more. But I think that um, given when they grew up and where they grew up and how they grew up, that I think that they were really um, doing the best that they could and, and giving me advice. I think that they thought at the time was going to be the safest for me and um, the, the most beneficial for me. But I think it was, it was way more complicated than I could have appreciated as a kid. And that, um, and I think that my parents may be anticipated. And so their approach to that was to just kind of not make waves. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, Rachel in our YouTube chat is asking um, for you to reflect on, did your relationship with your dad inspire your current work? Uh, totally. Um, <laughs> So I'm a clinical social worker and um, I actually uh, work for um, an awesome, I think it's awesome program that provides substance use treatment for parents. Um, so for adults, but in the context of them being a parent. So with thinking in mind that they, they are, um, are attached to children um, who they impact quite a bit and um, children who they love. And so I think really recognizing that, that parents can be loving parents and um, can be parents who really want to have their kids and have a substance use disorder at the same time. Um, and so, you know, I didn't, I never really, I didn't seek out this kind of work. It really found me, but I definitely recognize that um, my life experience is really uh, contribute to, I think, the compassion that I feel for for parents and for their kids and, and wanting to be a family despite some of the really big issues that they might face. I hope you get, um, somebody is asking whether uh, the stories are will be available after tonight's session and they will be. You can revisit the story that Amy has shared and also any of our stories on the YouTube channel. And Amy, I hope you'll take a minute to uh, to look at the comments uh, that are coming up um, when you have a chance from your story. Um, it's a very beautiful expression of love and appreciation for what you've shared with us tonight. So I really want to thank you. And I hope you have a, a minute to revel in that also. Thank you. Kevin, did you want to ask anything? Yeah. You know, just to, um, I think I sent, I sent Amy a comment and I don't want it to make it about myself, but I saw some parallels from my relationship. Um, <clears throat> actually, not necessarily a relationship with my dad, but kind of the whole aftermath of maybe people felt that they knew a totally different person than you did. Mm -hmm. And really, like, you know, I didn't necessarily have a relationship with my dad, but I, but people loved him. And all of those things that you read kind of says, so, so I had, like, did, at that point, did you, start to question yourself and what you thought about your dad? Um, no, not really. I think it was really actually very um, validating because I, I really did love my dad. I thought he was a, a kind person and a gentle person, but he had a lot of flaws. And so I think it was hard for me as a kid to kind of hold on to both of those things at the same time, to love someone who's really deeply flawed. And I think, um, reading those comments and, um, um, you know, having spent so many years of my life feeling ashamed of, of him and his actions. But I think reading those comments on legacy.com really validated that other people saw those good things about him too. And that he wasn't just, ju not just an alcoholic, so to speak, or not just a man with problems, but that he was a lot more than that. And so I was really glad that, um, that other people recognize that about him as well. And it helped me remember those things. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and everybody uh, virtually, please join us in thanking Amy for sharing her story with us tonight. Thank you for letting me. Absolutely, thank you.
Um, and so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, we have an opportunity to hear from two uh, wonderful tellers tonight. And so we will shift gears a little bit at this point and prepare to hear from our second teller for the evening. Um, also somebody who has been in the audience at, uh, at Storytellers, but actually uh, I got an opportunity to meet uh, Saul Fusener, our next, our next teller, uh, well before Kevin and I started Storytellers New Haven when he was uh, my son's teacher at New Haven Academy. Um, so he is an educator. Uh, he has since moved on where he is now the uh, Director of creative, write, creative Writing for the Educational Center for the Arts. Uh, ECA, um, a storyteller and a creator of space for story in his own right. Uh, he facilitates the songs and stories series at uh, Next Door Restaurant, which typically would be happening every month, but is on a, a bit of a break while we work through this COVID pandemic. Uh, and soon we'll be back, uh, I'm sure, in, in effect again. So we are really thrilled to welcome to the Teller's Chair, a storyteller in his own right, Saul Fusener. Welcome, Saul. Hi, thank you. Can, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I am going to talk about this person, Joseph Fusner, who I knew as Joe, um, my grandfather, who was uh, a very mysterious man. Uh, I learned 40 years after his death that his real name was Jacob Fusener, uh, you can see spelled differently, or Yaakov. Um, and I learned that from Israeli cousins. He would write to them and he would sign his name in Hebrew, Yaakov, uh, his real name. So for some reason, he changed both his first name and the spelling of his last name when he came to America in 1914. Uh, and in doing some research, there's not a lot on him on the internet, but I did find his voter registration from 1918 in Brooklyn. It was, he was registered at an address in East New York in Brooklyn and under political party was the word socialist. He left Poland on his own to live with some cousins in Brooklyn. The rest of his family stayed in Poland. This is a picture of Joe. He's the tall one with the three siblings of his who survived the Holocaust. The rest of his family died in the Holocaust. Another thing about Joe, unlike my father, who was a voracious reader, it said that Joe read one book in his lifetime. And it was this book, which I have yet to read, and I now feel I need to read, The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan. It was a book about an immigrant Jew uh, from Eastern Europe, much like my grandfather himself, who finds success in America, uh, but somewhat loses his soul when he finds success there. This is a picture of some of Joe's siblings who did not survive the Holocaust. And I assume this picture is from 1931 uh, because the youngest is a baby. And I know that all the children in this picture died at Auschwitz in 1941. And they were between the ages of 10, the youngest, and 18, the oldest. This woman is Sarah, Joe's sister. And this is Joe's stepmother. She's the only person in this picture who did not die at Auschwitz. She died of a heart condition in 1938, a year before the German invasion of Poland. Now this is gonna be backwards, so it's gonna be a little hard to read, but where Joseph lived uh, was right near the border of Belarus. I don't know if you can see that. 
Uh, if you look uh, near Belarus, if you can read backwards, you'll see that there's a city called Bialystok in, in just over the Polish border. And Joseph lived in a town that was near Bialystok. But my father never knew that because Joseph was so determined that the family never returned to Poland that he never told my father exactly where he was from. My father would say, was it near Warsaw? And Joe would say, oh, no, no, it was, no, it was nowhere near Warsaw. And my father would say, was it near Krakow? And Joe would say, oh, no, 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 it's nowhere near Krakow. And my father would say, well, then where was it? And Joe would say, I told you before, it was nowhere. But when I grew up, I became a teacher of Holocaust studies. And so I became very interested in this place where my grandfather came from and never wanted any of us to go back to. So I found a job as an educator with a group that was bringing Jewish students from America to tour Poland, to tour the places where the Holocaust took place, the concentration camps, but also uh, the places where Jewish culture existed before 1939, before the German invasion, and to look at those places and to visit those synagogues and to visit those oftentimes now restored little towns uh, of Poland or parts of major cities of Poland, where the synagogues were, uh, where the, the Jewish culture was. Now, this was part of a larger um, organization that was sending Jewish teenagers from all over the world to Poland in the same week. And we were all meeting at Auschwitz in the middle of the week. But the rest of the week, we were going all over Poland. And we had a bus that we took around Poland. And because there had been incidents in the past, we had a Polish Catholic security guard who would take care of us on the bus. And he would do some things that I'd never seen before. He would take these stickers and he would stick them over the gas cap so that if anyone messed around with the gas cap on the bus, we would know it because the sticker would be broken. And he would also place stickers on the luggage compartment. So if anyone tried to fiddle with the luggage compartment, we would know it, the sticker would be broken. And he was the world's greatest security guard because you always felt like he wasn't around. But then every time you looked for him, he was right there standing like this. He had a goatee beard. He always wore uh, camouflage cargo pants. He had tattoos. He had a shaved bald head. He was a very tough looking guy. He was a very auspicious security guard. And he was a Polish Catholic who my grandfather never would have trusted. My grandfather did not want us to go to Poland because to him, Poland was just a completely anti-Semitic place. You see, my grandfather was from what's often referred to as Poland B. In Poland, there's Poland A, the big cosmopolitan cities like Warsaw and Krakow, where people want to be part of the European Union and where people are more open to things that are different, to strangers. And there's also Poland B, which is more the farm country, the rural areas, the places where they've always been nervous that Russia would invade and take over. My grandfather was from Poland B. He was from a place where the Polish Catholic natives were always so nervous about Russian invasion that they looked at the Jews who lived there not so much as Polish people, but sort of as foreigners, foreigners in their territory. That's what my grandfather knew of Poland. And that's why he never wanted us to go there. But now we were being protected, this group of Jewish Americans, by this tough looking 
Polish Catholic security guard. Now, the food on this trip was all kosher food prepared in Brooklyn and sealed in plastic bags for us. It was terrible. I hated the food. I hated the instant coffee. But it was okay, because I loved this trip. I loved being here. I loved experiencing the place that my ancestors lived. So I was okay with the food. But the Polish security guard, his name was Tomek. Tomek noticed that I didn't like the instant coffee. So one day, while we were having dinner, I walked over to the, the table where the, the Polish crew was so they could be by themselves and speaking Polish. And I sat down and I introduced myself to Tomek. And I didn't know what to say. We didn't speak the same language. I only had a few Polish words. So I th said things like, uh, I like pierogi. Uh, you like pierogi? And Tomek said, yes, yes, I, I like pierogi. Uh, and I said to him, uh, I like bigos. You like bigos? And he said, Oh, yes, I, I love Bigos, but I can't eat too much Bigos, or I become Bigos. And in that way, we started to communicate with one another. And he looked at me and he said, you don't like the instant coffee. And I said, no, you got me. You're right. I don't like the instant coffee. And he reached into his cargo pocket and he pulled out this little bag of dark roasted Turkish coffee that was clipped with a paper clip. And he said, from now on, every morning, you come to me and we drink coffee together. We drink this good Turkish coffee. And so our friendship started by us always meeting for breakfast in the hotel lobbies and preparing his Turkish coffee with the hot water from the hotel. And when we got to the town of Luj, outside the Grand Hotel where we were gonna stay, there was a Polish film school walk of fame. And you could see on the ground the names like Agnieszka Holland and Krzysztof Kieslowski and Andrzej Wajda. And I was looking at these names and I had been the president of my film society in college. And I was looking at these Polish names and I was like, wow, look, there's Andrzej Wajda. And Tomek noticed that. And he said, you know Polish film? And I said, yes, I love Polish film. And he said, oh, you must see this film, The Promised Land by Andrzej Wajda. And there was something about that film he was trying to say to me, but he couldn't say it to me. He didn't have the language. But it was a film, a film about the city of Luj and how in the years, many years before the Nazi invasion, there are three main characters in this film. Turn of the century, Poland. One of them is a Polish Catholic. One of them is a German. And one of them is a Polish Jew. And they all own factories and it's about their friendship through the years. Now in Luj, there was a famous ghetto where Jews were, were kept before they were taken to the concentration camps. And in that ghetto was an undisturbed and very beautiful cemetery. So we went to the cemetery and in the cemetery, the graves for the ghetto dead, those who died in the 1940s are just really just like stick markers, but the graves for those who died before 1939 are beautiful, giant headstones with Hebrew writing. And they have these little sort of sidewalks around them and their gardens planted in there. And most of the gardens are going to seed now, except when they're taken care of maybe once a year, when family now comes through as tourists, but mostly the gardens have fallen apart, but you can see these were grand graves. This was a beautiful place for the Jewish community of Luj. And you can see how much they must have been accepted at one time in that part in Poland. And as I walked through this, these beautiful graves, 
I finally came to the main attraction of Lourdes Jewish Cemetery, this mausoleum. The mausoleum of Poznansky, Israel Poznansky was a very successful and wealthy industrialist who happened to be Jewish in the 1800s in the city of Lodz. There is a palace in the center of Lodz that he owned that is now the Museum of the History of Lodz. So here I was in Poland in this place where the only Jews really were ghosts and a few people who had rediscovered their Jewish roots many years after the Holocaust. And I saw this, this symbol it seemed for a time, a different time, when if you were Jewish, you could still be accepted like a citizen in Poland. And I was awed by, by the beauty and the grandeur of that and all that it symbolized. And I was just sort of standing there staring at this mausoleum. And I felt a presence come up behind me, the way you can feel someone's body when it's close behind you. But I didn't look back. And I heard a voice say, this is my history too, Mr. Saul. We share this history. The voice was Tomek's voice. And I still did not look back at him. But the two of us stared at that mausoleum. And it was the way in which sometimes when two people are staring at the same fixed point on the horizon, it's almost as if they're staring directly at one another. Thank you. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. It takes a it takes a second for us to get back to uh, get yeah. back to you. But thank you. That was uh, we just had two amazingly told stories um, tonight. Um, and the link around family history, I think, was so, so powerful to hear a story of a dad and a story of a grandfather um, today. So um, I'll kick off the first question again. And if you have questions, put them into our, our chat box here. But um, I wasn't clear. Was your grandfather <clears throat> was your grandfather still alive when you made the trip to Poland? And no, no, he Poland. died. Uh, he actually died uh, almost 40 years before I got to Poland. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So he didn't, he didn't have that. Your, what was your, was your father living? My father was also a deceased. My father died six years before I went to Poland. Okay. So that, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. There's, there's a lot of conversations I would have liked to have had with my dad after I, after I came back. Um, especially since he didn't even know exactly where his, his father was from in Poland. Uh, it was, um, the little town near near Bialystok. He was he was always you know he was told uh, I'm from nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did you keep any con any connect? Was it possible to keep any connection with? Tell me again, Tolnik? Is it Tolnik? Tomek. Tomek. Okay, I I went back to um, to Poland two years later, and we had the same uh, Polish guide. Uh, and I told him, you know, say hi to Tomek because we had a different security guard. I said, say hi to Tomek. Tell him Saul says hello. You know, absolutely. You know, there, there's some, there, it was very beautiful um, the way you talked about two people standing and looking at off in the horizon and um, and the the connection there, or or even the the statement about this is my history too. I mean, I in so many ways, I think that is. Um, the the spirit of storytellers New Haven is is to help um, help us look into the horizon in, in that way in which we can connect to each other's each other's humanity. So um, that was that was uh, so beautifully told. Um, let me see what what we have. Um, question 
Okay, so somebody else was wondering if you kept, kept in touch with Tomic. Um, what was your program called? Was that the, the program, I guess the, the program that took you back to, to Poland? Is that, that might be what yeah. the question is. Uh, it's called March of the Living. Uh, I was an educator for it in 2012 and 2014. Um, the students would then, after Poland, go to Israel, but I didn't go to Israel either time. It would be a week in Poland, or a little over a week in Poland, and then a week uh, in Israel. But both times I had to get back to teaching at New Haven Academy. I only had one week. <laughs> so I have the benefit of knowing a little bit about uh, New Haven Academy and the, yeah. the connection to, uh, to, to facing our history. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about your work in directing uh, creative writing. Sort of how does how has your experience um, informed how you work with students around their discovering their story and and yeah. exploring their own stories? Well, I do teach a, a storytelling class, a live storytelling class, um, when ECA is in normal session. Right now, I'm just teaching screenwriting because it's sort of hard to do the live storytelling class. Uh, when we're not in the building. Uh, in the building, we have all sorts of mic equipment and stuff like that. Um, and I, uh, this story, a, a shorter version of this story, I have told to my students um, uh, to make some, some points about storytelling, but they tell their own personal stories. Um, that, that storytelling class is specifically about them telling personal stories, not folk tales or anything like that, but taking their life uh, and these are kids who are writers, you know, they have poetry class, fiction class, et cetera. Um, so they are natural storytellers, but it's interesting. It's, you know, it's a different medium and some of them really take to it more than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, what, um, trying to see, Kev, can you read Roxana's question? Uh, amazing how stories of our lives circle back upon themselves. What, what, what is that? What oils be there? What, hmm. I'm not sure what that is. What, what, but what, um, I think the question is trying to get what, what about, what, hmm, what does your family, I don't know. Kev, do you know what that question is? <laughs> I, I can't see the, I can't see the chat, so. Okay. All right. Let me let me go to the next one. Um, how did the trip change your perception of your Jewish heritage? Huh. Um, I have to say um, that I really love being in Poland. Um, a lot of people who are Jewish were sort of frightened for me <laughs> that I was going there. They they have this image of Poland as, as being extremely anti-Semitic. And of course there, there's a terrible history there. Um, but I just, I can't explain it. When I was there, I just really felt like I was in touch with my ancestry in a way that I've never felt anywhere else in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is beautiful. You can understand why the Germans and the Russians fought over this territory. The area near where my uh, grandfather lives because I never got exactly there, but near there is some of the most beautiful farmland you'll ever see anywhere. We have to add this to our list, Kevin, of, of places <laughs> when, we, when we can travel again. When we, when we can travel again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, did you see The Promised Land or you just heard of, of what the film was? As soon as I got back to New Haven, I went to Best Video. And I rented Promised Land, uh, and that's when I saw it. In fact, when Tomek told me about it, he wasn't able to tell me very much about the plot because of the language barrier. Okay. So it was it was back in New Haven where I was watching it, and I was saying, it's about the friendship with this this Jewish man and these, you know, even though they're sort of portrayed in a negative way a little bit, I was like, that's what he was trying to get across. He couldn't say it to me. He was just saying, you got to see this film, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wow, love it, I love it. Um, all right, beautiful. I think that I think that's 
the questions we have. Again, I encourage you, Saul, to take a look. There are some really beautiful affirmations cool. um, being posted here um, and things that you, I think you'll enjoy reading as you, sure. as you have an opportunity. Um, so please, to our virtual audience, join us in thanking both Saul and Amy for such beautifully told stories, for giving so fully of your hearts um, today and sharing pieces of who you are through family story. Um, I have so uh, enjoyed this. This has been a beautiful evening of, of telling. Um, and it is exactly what Storytellers uh, New Haven seeks to, to produce, is a space where we can come together, uh, slow down a little bit, um, shut out some of the other noise that's out there and have an opportunity to really listen and notice um, aspects of each other's story um, and think about what that brings up for us, what questions it raises for us, um, what new uh, noti noticings we have. Um, and so I really appreciate you all uh, agreeing to do this. Um, and it is as simple as uh, agreeing to do it that can get you an opportunity also. If you're thinking, I'd love to be a teller, um, you can certainly reach out to Kevin or I at storytellersnewhaven at gmail.com. Uh, you can post it on our Facebook page. You can track us down. Um, we are, we are uh, easily accessible. We'd love to make space for you too to bring your story to storytellers. Um, we do have a session planned for June. It is the second Monday of June. I don't have my calendar open, but it's the second Monday of June, uh, 6.30. We'll be back here virtually. Um, and look forward to you being in that space with us uh, with us again. Kev, anything else for wrap yeah, up? Yes, so that date was June 8th. Thank you. Right. And um, no, I, I, you know, it's, it's almost uh, listening to those stories and, and well thought out and thought provoking. It's almost forgot that we were in a quarantine lockdown, right? I know. <laughs> And so, um, and, but again, like I said earlier, I'm glad we were able to kind of continue to bring this because this is what Storytell is about, trying to build community. And, you know, you, Karen, you said you knew Saul from New Haven Academy, but, you mm -hmm. know, I knew, I worked with Saul at ECA, right? And then yeah. kind of hearing these stories and, and um, I've seen Amy around, but then just to hear these, so I think this is kind of the epitome of what we wanted storytellers to be. So thank you all for sharing with us. Absolutely. Thank and you. please uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, special thanks to Kevin Ewing and the team at Baobab Tree Studios yeah. for all the technical support for us, uh, particularly as we've gone to virtual. This has been a, a true um, act of partnership here that we appreciate. So thank you all. Uh, continue to be safe and be well. Uh, COVID will pass. We will be together again, but until then, we will continue to connect virtually. So thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. See you next yeah. month. All right.